My guest today is Luke Bernard. Luke is a game designer with over a decade in the gaming industry who is the director of the upcoming game, The Light in the Darkness, the first ever video game about the Holocaust coming to Xbox later this year. Luke, thank you for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you. Thank you. Now, okay, so so you're, you're directing the first ever video game about the Holocaust. And I think when people hear that it's a video game centered around the Holocaust, they might be a bit skeptical, a bit jumpy, especially if they're not familiar with video games. I think to a lot of people, people think video games equals fun. But this is not that type of video game, is it? Yeah, and they also think video games equals Super Mario or high scores and kind of all those things. So the the reaction, I would say, it's in, it's interesting. So 10 years ago, when I first kind of had the idea for a project like this, the reaction from the mainstream press was, is he crazy, pretty much? And nowadays, the reaction from the mainstream press has been, can this be a new way of education? It's completely changed in the past decade, because I think, you know, um, people which have grown up on, on video games, we know video games can be whatever we want them to be. It can be an interactive film. It can, uh, that's kind of where they're heading. They're heading towards kind of future of storytelling. But in, in general with the older people, right? Um, when I talk to them, yeah, they do have a look in horror at first, very much when I just tell them how I'm working on a video game about the Holocaust, they just look at me like I've committed a crime very much until I actually explain to them and show them and then they actually basically get it and understand it. So it, it's, it's been so interesting because now I, th I think I've talked to nearly every single major Holocaust organization I have about it. And so, you know, so some, some don't believe video games can be educational. That's something which I disagree with. For, for multiple reasons, pretty much they're used in schools like it's that they are they are educational. And plus, fun fact actually, Ralph Bayer was the creator of video games. Ralph Bayer's family escaped the Nazis from Germany. He ended up in America. He made he made the first video game machine pretty much on uh, TV and all those things, and he basically viewed it as educational. So video games actually are actually a Jewish creation. <laughs> they are too. And someone who basically avoided, whose family avoided being murdered by the Nazis. So I think it's, it's, it makes it kind of even more uh, relevant to be able to use kind of this, um, you know, this, this form of education entertainment, which this man made very much. Um, so, so yeah, so it, it's, it's been a very interesting kind of journey because the people at Holocaust Education uh, and organizations who are, say, around maybe our age, they get it. They're like, this is, we need to do this. We, we all need to be doing this because they're finding out pretty much they're giving books to students or those things or they're talking to students and some, some of them come to me and they're like, they're falling asleep pretty much like most students are just like oh books or oh, this like you know and and also that, well that's why survivor testimonies do so well because you know they actually have someone to listen to they do pretty much but we're at an age right now where survivors are really old and it's it's you know it's we, we can't be the last generation to uh, witness survivors basically and the problem is well, I believe no one has thought about what's the next step or how do we kind of, um, you know, continue education in new ways. Because I think education is trying to get the digital generation to adapt to them rather than trying to adapt to the digital generation pretty much. And I, I, I've noticed because I, I, I mean, a very known TikTok account like, uh, Dov and Lily, pretty much, the um, Outswitch survivor, you know what they did, pretty much, deciding to go up on TikTok. I, I've always said this. I think that they've done more for Holocaust education, awareness, awareness, I'd say more, than any major organization has done in the past five years, just because of their TikTok account alone. 
and it didn't cost them any money. They just decided to put it up and people are reacting really well to it. They are. They're going towards a new audience, which no one no one is in yet, very much. Because if you look in terms of social media, I mean, apart from Outswitch Museum, which does a great job, there's kind of no presence much or trying to even use these digital platforms. And then when you have basically polls come out pretty much where it's like, hey, no one knows what Outswitch is. Nobody knows how many people died in the Holocaust. The point is you put out, all these stats are being put out, but there's no solutions being put out. It's just like, here are the stats. Everything's terrible. This is the end. And I think there needs to be solutions um, to these things. That's how come I, I viewed personally like how comic books were viewed, viewed as insane at one point until Mouse came out. Film was kind of viewed as like, I don't know, man, until Showa came out and um, Schindler's List. So I, I think video games need to be able to tackle the subject because we're the number one form of entertainment. And I think rather than discouraging game developers towards doing it and erasing it, right? Because then we're erasing it, we are. We can't century in history. We should actually be able to guide game developers, encourage them to make these games pretty much. I mean, the more interactive films there would be because then there'd be more awareness. Because again, everyone gets a history I hate to say, you know, a lot of people get the history from Call of Duty. And my problem with Call of Duty is that they don't actually have, um, they don't really mention the Holocaust. And I think that's worse than them trying to do a camp scene, right? At least trying to do one, you, you know? So that's kind of what I stand on those things, which depending on who you talk to, you know, difference of opinions happen. Right. Right. Now, with this game, I'm mean, first off, would you say video game is the right term for what this is even? Well, it's 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 what our, our medium is called, but I it can be called several things, like an interactive story, um, educational video game. It can be called several things it can but to me, it kind of doesn't really change what it is. It's still always the same thing it is. So it's still like an interactive story, no choice, pretty much, and to immerse yourself. And But if if I moved the term video game, it wouldn't be true because it still is on those platforms like Xbox. It will also be out on PlayStation and Nintendo Switch. So it's still out it's still on a video game machine, it is, pretty much. And, and I really think, I, I really stand by, pretty much, the fact that Ralph Bayer made them. And, and that's why I think when people would dismiss video games in the Holocaust space, the first thing I'd just be like, well, Ralph Bayer, Holocaust survivor, made them. Used them as educational. I bet you didn't know that fun fact. So that that's kind of where I, I guess, where I have the confidence um for this thing and, I, and i'm not saying to say that i'm going to make the best thing ever or i'm going to be the answer to it what i'm really trying to do is kind of open up the door for us as developers to be able to feel comfortable to do this too because i i really do think i mean the moment that you get like i know like a triple a really expensive video game that actually can tackle this you know i think that'd be just great that would you know one you know, how those kind of big budget things, even if Call of Duty tackled it, you know, because it's, it's kind of insane to do a World War II game without mentioning the Holocaust. Right. It is. Right. Now, without giving too much away, can you tell us much about the plot of the game? And when people actually play the game, what does it look like? What does it feel like? So basically people can always see it up on YouTube. They can. It's on IGN and also on Xbox's channel. The trailer. Um, yeah, the trailer, and it also explains the gameplay on IGN's uh, YouTube. We did that for Holocaust Memorial Day was IGN. So first gaming site to actually acknowledge uh, Holocaust Memorial Day. So that was good. Um, but basically, the story of the game is about um, Polish Jews in France during the Holocaust. And so you follow a French, not, not French, a Polish Jewish family in France. So you get to play or more like interact and kind of experience the, the story kind of, you know, from France before the occupation, 
pretty much, you know, up to the occupation, anti-Semitism rising, pretty much kind of up to the moment. I mean, you know, I'm not that there's going to be any spoilers, but pretty much, you know, we know what happened in the Holocaust. It's not going to have a happy ending. And so, yeah, we're kind of going through every single step. But what we, what I really wanted to do is really actually have you become attached to these characters get to see who they were, kind of get to live their life, rather than just go automatically into the bad things. Because I just wanted, because you know how film is and all that, you kind of want people to become attached emotionally. So then it kind of has a bigger impact on the viewer or on the player, pretty much. So um, what, what I did is, so I took sev- there's d- several different, like, testimonies and things like that and also talk to different survivors and took lots of different elements pretty much um you know to kind of create a story pretty much the story which i wanted to tell so i didn't like take a story of someone who had died or who who had survived i hadn't because i really wanted to show so many different elements i did so i just took multiple things i just crafted something together it all has all the historical facts Also, in between scenes, pretty much you'll have an option to be able to listen to survivor testimonies, pretty much uh, French survivors. And so you kind of see, you'll be able to see kind of, you know, the similarities compared to what they went through to what that current scene is showing. So I guess that's kind of like the educational uh, aspect to it, where, you know, it's optional. You can view them or if you don't want to, you don't have to. But so I think, you know, because that was also to kind of... uh, because Unisense has a very cut animated art style, it does. So, you know, I still wanted to show some real people in there too, so people could be like, okay, this is like real too, it is pretty much. Yeah. What was that like, by the way, to work with Holocaust survivors on this game? How did that feel? Well, a lot of them, they're pretty much like normal people um, that, that they are pretty much. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it's, it was very, how can I say, more normal uh, it, it was. And while we did for a lot of the testimonies, I just had the families record, I did with them privately, because like one, for example, she's 96, she is, and um, she'd never recorded their testimony before, not even for the Sher Foundation, because I, I just didn't want to put them under any kind of pressure where, you know, you'd have all these people around, you'd have all these people interrogating them, you know, like I, I didn't want to create that kind of atmosphere. So really one thing which, how can I say, with working with survivors, which I noticed was how bad actually reparations have been. They, they haven't been good at all. Like I found out pretty much the, the French survivors barely got anything. Like maybe sometimes a check of a thousand euros. It, if they were children, even if, say, their parents got wiped wiped out just because they weren't in Outswitch and things like that. And then I just started finding out pretty much that a third of Holocaust survivors live in poverty in the world. And it's just, how can I say, I felt I felt a lot of unease in in the way that pretty much we just have so much you know everyone knows about the holocaust we put so much into it monuments all those things non-stop and really nice museums all those things but a third of them can't afford food and i'm like this is really so bad it is so that, that kind of really changed um a lot of kind of direction of where i was kind of going with everything and i think that's why i became really involved in trying to fundraise for holocaust survivors and those things because i'm just like we don't, we don't have many years left to, for these people to be able to live in dignity, you know, at least spend the last years in dignity. And I, I, I just think when we say never again, things like that also means looking after the people who, because, because again, when you've been through that, when you've had your entire family gone, sometimes it's just hard. It's just hard to get back up. It, 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 it is really. So, so, so that's really one thing which kind of, I guess made this project or how can I say just really a lot more personal 
it 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 did really pretty much. So, so it's it's quite clear that the Holocaust isn't only the content of the game, but it's also influenced the nature of the game. Because you have said that the game does not allow the player to make any choices that affect the story. And your reason for this was to simulate the lack of control that Jews had during the Holocaust. And I thought this was very interesting because the nature of the Holocaust is affecting the nature of the game. How important was this aspect of the game to you? And how did you decide on this feature? Well... I, th- I think it just f- came from really studying the Holocaust because pe- people that survived, it was really just luck. It, it was. It wasn't like, um, you know, a choice. It, it wasn't. Everything was just, just kind of pure luck who kind of managed to survive or not. And I think if I made choice-based things, right, it would make it seem like Jews could have saved themselves, very much and i mean there's so many multiple factors to the holocaust pretty much why it happened um, i mean the fact that pretty much loads of countries closed closed their doors didn't allow refugees in you know how um how basically as the jews were trying to get to what was british palestine back then but britain closed it down like how britain only allowed ten thousand children on the kinder transport like all those things are pretty much out of everyone's control. And I know some people that pretty much their mothers had to give them up pretty much just, just so they could live. So it, that, that's really, if, if I made it choice-based and it could affect the story, then it just make it seem like people had a choice. And that's why I really just had to eliminate that. So that's again, what makes it very weird for a video game without any choice. It, it does. And that's what, that's what I think what kind of makes it, um, I mean, it's more like, I guess, an artsy video game. It is. It's, it's very different than anything else um, kind of ever done before in that medium in, in that regard. But I think that's, that's really essential um, to it, that is, too. Yeah. I mean, it really sounds like you're sort of redefining what, what the definitions of what can be a video game, to be honest. Y- yeah. Yeah, I mean, I I honestly always viewed video games as kind of interactive films. I I, I did pretty much what what I enjoy with video games is that compared to a film where I'm just looking at it like that passive, right? In a video game, I'm actually in that world. I'm actually in those scenes. I'm actually in that story, and that's why I viewed this as something to be very impactful for people to actually be there directly in france during those times and you know of course with it with the video game too that that's that's also why i'm not having like you're not having kind of any scenes in out switch for example you're not because that would no no that was just that just even me as me myself as a player i'd be like i cannot play that i can't and also everyone knows what happened you know over there too so that's why i don't need to go there but all kind of all the other things, you know, we can really show like how, you know, the French Jews had to go register the police to get their stars, all those things. You can basically see like the roundup, like all those things you can actually put the player directly in it. And I think they feel a lot more, even how the world is changing of uh, France pretty much. Kind of before it starts getting really anti-Semitic. So you'll you're notice as, as, since you're those characters directly, how kind of the other civilians and people react to you like before the occupation then during the occupation you know with the yellow star the other characters will react differently to you so you're actually really how can i say get to experience things a lot more personally and kind of understand it and kind of feel more you'll, you'll have a more meaningful kind of experience rather than just being again passive looking at it very much yeah now i think it's very interesting that you you chose france because i think when when one you know you're going to do a a game about the the holocaust people might expect it to be set in germany or poland but you've set it in france under the vichy government why did you make this decision well i'd say what one one of the big reasons because i'm french uh even if i sound british i'm actually french and also 
So what makes the Vichy government kind of so interesting is that, well, it was France that deported the Jews. It was France that decided to deport the children, not even the Nazis. Even the Nazis were to the French government being like, that might be a bit too much. People might notice. And so the French government went full on collaboration and they weren't Nazis. They were bad people, but they they had the same intent as the Nazis. And I think what that that's also a good thing to show too is because everyone just, when you think Nazi, everyone is just like, oh, that, of course, Nazis are bad, right? But everyone just imagines pure evil, ugh, that kind of thing. But Nazis were everyday, normal German people. They were. They had families, they were normal, they're like everyone else. And I think setting in France also shows how it wasn't just the Nazis that did this, and also how everyday people can become hateful and like the Nazis very much. Because because that's, that's one thing which I, I just kind of noticed. I mean, j just when you study different genocides too, like it's not you know Nazis aren't the only ones that do do that did genocide, and and that's why I think it's kind of more like taking away that stereotypical kind of mis mystical evil kind of thing, which of course are Nazis are, but kind of showing more this, these are humans that did this. This is what hate leads to very much. So that that's where it's different kind of aspects. And I think when people will, will play it and be like, wait, it was the French government that did this. It was the French policeman that rounded them up. Then they actually kind of realize the extent to how, bad the holocaust was because a lot of people just think oh it's just the nazis they they did pretty much and no it was europe europe did this you know it wasn't i mean governments full-on collaborated that, that they did and they didn't have to go that far so they didn't the french government did not have to go that far the french government should have been um during the Nuremberg trials, should have been up there with Germany. They should have. And that's uh, that's one thing, again, I'm French. I actually love France, I do. But that also means you have to address the dark historical past of your country. You do too, and to actually, you know, so more people know the truth of it. Yeah. Now, as you know, as we've been saying, the light and the darkness is an educational game, and and many would argue that Holocaust education is still very much needed across the world. But there are debates as to what the correct age is to expose people to the horrors of the Holocaust. For example, uh, when Piotr Savinsky, the director of the Auschwitz Museum, was on our podcast, he said that typically it's when people are around age fourteen or fifteen years old that they stop seeing themselves as just their parent's child and start to consider their own role in the world and therefore actually able to process the Holocaust and the impact of it. Now, your game is rated suitable for people ages 10 and up. I'm wondering how you came to this decision and what were some of the things that you had to factor in? Uh, so, so basically for the rating, right, um, I didn't really get to decide the rating. It's what I submitted to the rating system and they decided it was, it was suitable 10 up. Me personally, the way I see it is like, I think anybody should be able to play it pretty much, you know. But I think honestly, like the like the person at the Outswitch Museum, he's right. It should be teenagers up, because because I think pretty much like, listen, you, you give this to a ten year old, you teach a ten year old about the Holocaust, he's just gonna be like, what? And then after he completely forget it, he will. So teenagers are the right age. I mean. We were shown Schindler's List in my school when I was a teenager, and all of us remember that film. <laughs> we do. So that that's why, no, I, I, I think that's actually the, the perfect age kind of ongoing. But also, I can't view this as something which all ages will kind of play, people in their 30s pretty much, because I'm also, I, I don't think Holocaust education just necessarily even has to do just with teenagers. It's also adults too, like I'm finding out new things you know and i'm 35 i am and some people in in a, <clears throat> like that cricket guy in, in in the uk who said he'd never ha heard of outswitch and i i actually believe him i absolutely believe him on that i do 
So, you know, even him at his age, he's like, I don't know about all these things. And, you know, there's, there's lots of people that might not know about this. And that's why I think, yeah, to me, it's kind of teenager up. It is pretty much or whatever age people decide to kind of uh, play the game. Right. Now, now the game is actually free. You People don't have to pay to play it because you said that you, you refuse to profit off of it. Uh, is that right? Like, how did you come to that decision? Uh, well, it kind of was from the beginning, uh, pretty much. I, I just, so one really, well, I really wanted it free because I wanted it to reach millions of people. And so my games have been played by tens of millions of people they have already, but I really wanted to just have a massive reach because I think the big problem with Holocaust education is it's only focusing on people inside cities meaning people have access to museums, people have access to good funding for their school system. It completely forgets about everyone else inside the countryside and all those things. Like I know I come from the countryside in France. I come from a poor rural area in France. And the only thing our teacher could do is just show us Schindler's List, pretty much. And so I'm trying to reach all these regions which no one else is trying to reach. And that's why I think having it free... So, of course, you have, you know, some ed education like school systems that might want to use it, right? But I think a lot of people just might be curious. They just be like, oh, what's this about kind of thing? And then they download it and they play it. And then hopefully they get engaged in the story and want to finish it till, till the end. And so that's really the big reason for making it free. It's kind of to reach other areas which no one else is reaching. And I think pretty much the... Profit, profit part is like yeah I can I don't I I, I I don't yeah I don't want to profit off uh off the Holocaust because that that's again one thing we we I live in America now so I live in Los Angeles uh, and one of my big problems has been pretty much how much money is spent in Holocaust awareness and just this and that I won't name names you know and when I see some CEOs which are making a million dollars a year. And, and survivors live in poverty. I'm just like, this is not okay. So as so I'm, I'm, I'm just coming in. I'm just like, I don't want to profit off this. I just want people to be educated. I just want us to remember the people that that died. It's, it's just, I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of like it just, just a goal of mine. It, it is. I, I think it's kind of, kind of like me, like my life's goal. It's just, just have people rem remember because, because I just view this as. I guess I have a different way of viewing this. Like, I, I, I see this as, as us losing so much European culture, our, our neighbors, our friends, our, you know, just all these artists, all these families forever gone. I just think it's that I don't know why. I just can't wrap my head around it. I can't. And then I think about things about how my family was lucky to be in the UK pretty much and you know i don't know if i would have existed if i wasn't in the uk so maybe i feel like a sense of guilt of like hey like you know i got to be exist i did so i have to do something i do about this and i, and I think because a lot of people that you know they often ask me like people have asked me why are you so obsessed you know that was years ago and these people are dead you know they've been on they've been not that sensitive you know they're asking me all those things i'm just like i have to do something pretty much because i know i can't you know i can't hold nazis accountable anymore you know they're mostly dead i mean yeah they're all dead they are pretty much so i have to at least you know do something so we can at least remember these people and, and, and i kind of want people to remember that so that's one big thing which so i have some issues in terms of how we remember things, how we show photos. We're like, this is this guy, this is the date he died. I don't like that. I would rather us be like, this is, I don't know, this is, I'm just going to say a stereotypical name. This is Ben Cohen, <laughs> and he was a painter. He had three kids, he has a great husband. Just those kind of small things. I just want us to kind of humanize the people we lost more. So I, I guess that's why. A lot of my, in, in my spare time, I like find out a lot of stories about people that died. Like I find out 
who they were, all those things. And it's, it's led me to discover amazing stories and talk to the families who they've lost that family member and find so many documents of so many brave people, actually. There's like one person, for example, Marion Cohen. She saved like, I think, 20 children. She did pretty much. She was Jewish in France. She got killed. She got beaten to death pretty much because she refused to give them up. She's a hero. She is uh, to me, you know, but she's not remembered enough. Then you have Eva Koshera killed in Auschwitz. She opened up the first lesbian bar in New York City. She's a pioneer of LGBTQ rights. She's forgotten too. So all these people, I'm just like, we need to remember who they were rather than just a number that died. So I so I know there's like six million people can go through those, right? But that's what I think would make things really a lot more powerful. And actually in, in terms of education, get people to pay attention more. Because I think when we when we come up, because even even me, I can't comprehend it. When we're like six million died, that's such a high number that your brain nearly kind of explodes, right? It does. So you kind of have to approach things bit by bit and back, like, this is this family. Guess what they did? To humanize them more. So if you don't just put down numbers, right, rather than humanizing it, people won't get an emotional attachment and therefore they won't care. And that's why I think why I think we've had um, maybe why we're facing a lot of issues in terms of maybe people not caring as much, very much. Because I say I think Shinder's list really changed everything because it showed a story, it had characters which people could become attached to. And, that, and that's why I think it's, it's such a powerful thing it is. You know, no matter if people like it or don't like it, that's why that's what I think film has been really good in terms of uh, memory it has. Yeah, I mean, as you say, you know, we, we, we get familiar with Yitzhak Stern, like he is an accountant, he lives here, like he, he speaks this way, he's not just a number that died. And that's sort of what you're doing in your game. We follow, uh, for however many hours the game lasts, this boy, I think he's called Samuel, throughout his journey, uh, we get to know him, we get familiar with him. And, you know, in a sense, like we become his friend, he's not just born this date, died this date. Yeah, yeah, but, but base, basically precisely. And you also get to know his family and all those things. And his family isn't perfect. They aren't either. Like, they're kind of like a normal uh, family. They, they are. So, so I really think it's all about, you know, getting, getting people attached and to view, just view these people as human rather than just numbers that died. So, so, so I really think that, again, is kind of the new leading with empathy and caring, I think. That, that's why I think it's kind of, you know, because I'm more of an artist rather than an educator. An educator, they'd be focusing these other facts. This is this. This is what happened. Did you memorize how many did, did this? And uh, me personally, I'd be a lot happier if people memorized kind of some of the victims became attached to them. And just felt that kind of human connection rather than just memorizing numbers very much. So that that's where I'm kind of, again, trying to offer something different. And and also, I mean, we're going to be working with a school district um, up, up in Canada. I can't mention which one yet, but so pretty much up in Canada. And what we're going to do is we're going to have students, say, for example, play the game. And then the teachers are going to see if after playing the game, they're more interested to learn more about the Holocaust, the more, how can I say, edu educational school-based things, pretty much. Because then they could, be, they could be more interested, they could, because some teachers have come to me and they've been like, when our students played Assassin's Creed, right, because it's set in ancient history, suddenly they pay a lot more, more attention in history class. They do. So... So we're kind of wondering, you know, because it's a bit like, you know, like all those films, it's just how young people are. It, it is. It, it's just a reality. If you go to young people, it's like, do you want to know just only about murder? They're just like, oh, God, this sounds horrific. And then they just either be so traumatized and not want to learn about it. But if you lead with a story, even if it's a dark story, they'd be like, oh, OK, I know what happened in this story. OK, how did all this happen? Why did this happen? Basically, I mean, so that's kind of 
I'm trying to just get the curiosity of people again to learn more. And then after, it'd be up to the museums and all those things. People actually might be, I mean, like in the independent article, I mean, we're going to be displaying the game in the Pop Culture Museum in Seattle, which is next to all the things with Marvel stuff. I know it's a pop culture museum, but pop culture does shape culture and people learning about things. That's why I always go back to Schindler's List. It wasn't just because it was one of the first movies about the Holocaust. It's because it's such a thing in pop culture. And that's why we know so much. You know, people in general know so much about the Holocaust, Schindler's List, they do. So that's what I'm just trying to do. It's just kind of shape that the video game part of pop culture so then people can become interested in all the other elements because again it is let's be honest it is kind of hard but if it's not a school trip right to you know to tell some people on holiday hey do you want to go see the holocaust museum people i know who visit those places are people like me and people and jewish people and people interested in it or members of my family right but i've never like (laughs) <laughs> you know, just just heard you know the average normal person go to those museums and, and that's why i think just again just getting the curiosity in people might make them go to all these uh things again i mean that that's kind of my intent it is and i i hope i hope it can um work i mean if you look at it museums are trying to digitalize things anyways i mean the show foundation is building you know those uh survivor hologram things that everyone's trying to digitize it because everyone knows that's what people like nowadays they do pretty much yeah i mean as you said earlier we we need to adapt holocaust education for younger people not try and drag them into a medium that may be outdated not outdated but young people don't necessarily want to pick up a book or go to a museum as much as they might like to watch a film or play a video game um and it's it's like you say with the facts and figures it's hard for people to get emotionally invested in numbers. It's very easy for them to get emotionally invested in a story and a narrative. Yeah, I mean, if if you look at it with human humanity, I mean, all of humanity is based on stories. It is from religion to politics to everything to history. You know, it's all it's all stories. It is pretty much, and and that that's why I think again. I, I think if Holocaust education just narrowed it down because because mm. I, I give you another example right like I was talking again with the the it was because it was the Canadian uh, Toronto Museum that showed me pretty much the story is this Iranian politician who spent all his money rescuing French Jews he did in Paris he basically was like pretending they were all Iranian he was pretty much getting them over to Iran. And he was a Muslim, and I was like, when they showed me that, I was like, that story, right? That story should be brought to Muslim students, because then they'd suddenly have like a guy they can relate to and be like, oh, cool, well, I want to know what 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 happened with him, and then that kind of can you know allows them to learn all the other different aspects of the Holocaust. And when you see people like Eva Koshova, which who was a lesbian, right? Pretty much like then you become like, you know, for LGBTQ students that can become interesting. So so many different aspects of the Holocaust, so many different stories where you can kind of adapt that to the audience you're talking to, to get them interested. Because the reality is this, let's be honest. When people, people like to pay attention to things when it kind of, um, when they can kind of relate to it in some way. And, and that's why I understand why uh, Spielberg went with Oscar Schindler. So I know there's, there's a lot of groups who are like, we don't like Chin's List because it tells a white perspective, you know, the white savior. But I understand why he did that, because he knew that most people, well, most people aren't Jewish, right? So they need a character they can follow to kind of know everything else that's kind of going on pretty much. So I, I understood kind of why he did that. While well, was me with The Light in the Darkness, so... The, the, the family, pretty much, I, I made them really uh, secular, I did, pretty much. So they don't, they're culturally Jewish, but they don't really necessarily care that much. You know, they're not like uh, super religious or anything. They aren't, I went more for the, them being ethnically Jewish, I did. And it was more to, to show 
people and when they play the game to be like, oh, wait, no, they weren't different. They were like us very much. Yeah, they were French. They were European kind of thing. And so then they can kind of even understand more kind of how insane the whole thing was very much. So so that's why, because, you know, if I, if I went, say, for example, for really orthodox characters, for like, you know, not everyone could necessarily relate. They couldn't. So you always have to think of ways to bring in your audience to have most people be able to relate and get attached kind of as possible yeah yeah now um you yourself are jewish and you discovered that you were jewish in quite an interesting and unexpected uh, manner how did this come about yeah so pretty much long story short grand my grandmother hid it after world war ii she did and then one of my uncles reappeared pretty much and then it, of course his last name was wolf it was and then pretty much everything came out and it was like grandma wait what have you been hiding pretty much and my aunt had hid it she had pretty much um but i can't understand why she did that so because i i can understand that because just yes, because you know you uh, once you've kind of you know, being first times, even even if she was in the UK, since she looked after kinder transport children, you can have that fear that something could happen again. So I can kind of understand that. And then especially after when at once I did kind of my DNA test, I was like, well, that's that then <laughs> pretty much. Yeah, that's and I didn't really honestly I didn't really care much. I didn't know. I was just like, okay, cool, do, 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 move on, you know. Uh I guess I started really came when I started researching about the Holocaust in my early 20s, late teens. But then I started caring a lot more in my 30s or the past kind of um, two years, maybe. I started caring more about it when anti-Semitism started going up. That That's when I started being more out there and being like, hey, I'm a Jew too, mate. You know, like, so because... Yeah, I, I never saw a witness this in my lifetime. That's like, I honestly didn't care. I was just like, do, do, just go on with my life kind of thing. And when anti-Semitism started to rise, I, I, I think that kind of made me more, more outspoken about being Jewish. It did. And I, I guess because I'm not religious in one bit. So, so I, I just believe in the ethnic group. I do pretty much, you know. That that's you know kind of like how David Bedell is very much. That that's basically what I, but believe in. You know, of course, there's the religion there's, but I'm more focused on the ethnic group because Jews. I mean, it's beyond the the Holocaust wasn't because of religion. David Bedell has been on the podcast, and as he said, like the Nazis don't care whether you kept kosher or not. I, I, exactly, and anti Semites don't care either. They, they don't pretty much. It's kind of always the same thing. It's always... So that's what made me came out kind, kind of a lot more. And especially like my uncle, for example, my cousins, like he married like a, a Jewish uh, woman. So his cousin's like, my cousin, like full on Jews, they are pretty much. And I'm just like, I, I don't want kids. I don't want kids to, you know, grow up in, a, in, a, in an anti-Semitic Jewish hating world. I don't very much because you know I'm fine. Like, can no one messes with me? Like, I'm a big guy, you know I am, and plus I look kind of scary. So you know, i you know like when people try like messing with me, I'm like, yeah, come say it to my face, mate. But it's it's for all the it's for all the young people like like the kids and everything. When I just see what kids are going through and what's happening inside schools all that, I'm just like, this is not okay so I'm, I'm hoping you know with the game the game became suddenly really relevant like how it just wasn't just about educating about the holocaust but it was also about educating what hate leads to very much and and that's when i see countries like france right which are going up in anti-semitism i'm like i love france i love my country and you know it absolutely breaks my heart so that's like i'm trying to figure out ways to fix this and fix people's minds pretty much like so they can stop being like that i mean d don't don't get me wrong i i don't think majority of the world is anti-semitic i just think 
the way it's heading right now, we need to stop this, we do, before it gets really, really bad. Mm. Yeah. Um, it's very interesting and ironic, the fact that the rise in anti-Semitism made you more of a Jewish activist. Yeah, no, I... I, I yeah, I, I actually really didn't, especially... Uh, Especially last year, with with when uh, there was all those things going on with Israel and Palestine. I mean, because I was getting like, I was getting like these insane messages when I was not even. I'm not. I've never even been to Israel, right? I, to me, Israel's a country in the Middle East. Cool, that's it, right? And people were just sending me messages like, "You dirty Zionist, you dirty this." And I'm just like, "What the hell is going on?" basically and you know it's, it's it's kind of i'd never seen anything kind of like it the holocaust museum which i live right next to the los angeles one people had nazi flags on top of the israeli flag right and i'm just like but, but walking in front of the holocaust museum and i was just like what are you doing that's a country in the middle east very much this is a holocaust museum keep keep that filth out of it pretty much those nazi flags and so, so I think that kind of um, the racism kind of going on now is just so, because this is how I believe about governments, right? I don't like any government. I like the French government. I don't like the American one. I don't like any government. I don't very much. I'm kind of anti all governments I am. But I like people inside countries. I do very much. And so I will not ever hate a people for the actions of their government, I won't, and I, and that's what that's what you sort pretty much. Whether people agree with the Israeli government or not, you know, it's just pretty much just it it it's just it's, it's so wrong just to to attack just random Jewish people. <laughs> in the West, it makes zero sense. It 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 does. You know, it's it's kind of like. You know, when we're seeing, like, in in, in America, you know, uh, the Asian hate going on pretty much just because people don't like China. It's like, it's, but yeah, the issue is trying to figure that out because to me, right, it's so nonsensical. It is, you know, because it's so, but yeah, I guess that kind of made me even more outspoken uh, kind of about things. Cause that's, cause I think also so a lot of people, they come to me. So I actually have a, a lot of uh, Palestinian scholars actually follow my work and actually I'm really supportive of it, actually message me and all those things. And I also have, um, I also sometimes, sometimes some people who are very um, kind of borderline anti-Semitic, they, they reach out to me and say things like, you're one of the good Jews. And I'm just kind of like, that's even more messed up, man. Who to say that? I, I hate that even more. I'd rather you just hate me, you know? And so... But, but I so, so I think just being more outspoken about it and just being like, hey, stop hating people. So that's kind of why I think being more outspoken pretty much and kind of looking different, right? Or more like not looking like, look, looking more different, like, you know, I kind of have my own look going, right? I I think maybe that can make people kind of think differently because because again so that's what i'm kind of trying to do for on a personal level but of course i hope the video game really actually is the thing that changes minds i mean i plan to launch that worldwide i plan to translate into arabic i do too i plan to translate in so many different languages so i just hope you know people in other countries like egypt for example where they you know quite high the anti-semitism is over there is you know hope hopefully some Egyptians can't play it and then they're like, oh, wait I can't like these characters or well, maybe, so that that's kind of what I'm hoping that people play it and they're like, oh well, wait, kind of like these characters maybe I shouldn't be so anti-Semitic you know I don't want to appear like those guys like those French people they're oh you know, because because I can't think when uh, that scene in Schindler's List where you had that girl be like goodbye Jews that's yelling right. I just remember in the classroom, I don't think anyone after that would, because uh, in my school, right, I don't think it's going to say my school was great, but I never heard anything anti-Semitic in my school. And I think it's once you see that film and you see that, that girl, you're like, oh, I definitely don't want to be her, 
you know? So I yeah, think the, the face of innocence so yelling that. Yes, yeah, that's what I mean. It was kind of worse than a Nazi because a Nazi's just a bad guy, but a kid, you're just like, oh. So I, I really think those small things with pop culture actually do change people's minds because they just don't want to be seen as as all that. And then if they have some kind of messed up thoughts, they'd be like, oh, okay, I shouldn't be like that, basically. So that's kind of how I view things. I, I think if we just like very much, you just shouldn't be... Um, it's, it's a weird thing how humans are. Because if it's just like, if you go up to someone, you're just like, you just shouldn't be racist because racism is bad. They just might be like, I don't care what you're saying, kind of saying, you know, they'd be stubborn. But if you kind of have something pop culture like Inchins, listen, that girl, right? You, you kind of just don't want to be that person. You don't. That's maybe how I assume humans could be. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I want to get your opinion on anti Semitism and Nazi imagery in video games and in the gaming industry. So as a Jewish person and a video game creator, what are your thoughts on games where they use subject matter like the Nazis in the context of like violent shoot 'em ups where the player has to kill the Nazis? Like, do you think some issues should like that should only be handled sensitively or do you think that with games anything goes? So I would so funny enough, one of my favorite video games, story wise, is actually the new Wolfenstein games. And the new Wolfenstein games, pretty much BJ Blazkowicz, because of playing words, you know, he's actually Jewish. He is. So you get to go into his past about his mother, pretty much. And you kind of know she's kind of a survivor. She is. And they really brought out kind of the trauma of being Jewish, you know, around Nazis, all those things. And they just made a really good story, even if it had robot Nazis, right? And I think since the story was so good, and the fact that, again, it focused on a Jewish character, it did, um, I think they actually did a really good job. So it's, it's a bit like how I will be okay with fictional things like Inglourious Bastards. I'm actually fine with that film. I, I am too, because it doesn't shy away from the horrors, the real life horrors of what the Nazis were. What I have an issue with is Nazi zombies, because Nazi zombies turns them into fantastical creatures, doesn't make them real anymore make some fantasy and sorry let me just say for our listeners who may not be familiar with video games i'm not going to say that the the name of the game but this is a very popular game maybe around in the mid 2000s where the player had to kill nazi zombies just to put that into context oh and, and it's still it's still going on today it's still one of the most popular uh video games it is and so that thing there like it's it, it just it's kind of that's a bad part of pop culture where it turn Nazis into fantasy creatures or even a bit like how in Indiana Jones the bad guys were the Nazis kind of thing like it, it nearly just make them too goofy too fantasy like and kind of took away really the horror of them so I'm okay if you go fantasy like Wolfenstein but really to show the Nazis how horrific, horrific they were and also the trauma they inflicted on the people but if you just fantasize them that's what i'm kind of against and where i think it's just really um kind of like how can i say uh distortion uh, and it's just it's, it's, it's just it's it's very how can i say it's just it's very uh bad it, it is like it like again i i just i have no problems with using fantasy things i don't it just D depends. I mean, of course, they're the ultimate bad guy for a video game, but I just think it's just... I mean, it's also movies are, are responsible for this too. They are, like Indiana Jones. Just... Yeah, that's, and I also think that's, that's the reason why we should be actually addressing the Holocaust in video games. Because if people, young people, their only uh, kind of knowledge of Nazis is, is, is zombies then, of course, they just think everything, oh, that's not real. 
oh, maybe that's exaggerated. You know, they think all those things after. They do. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think it's been one of actually one of the worst things which we've done, uh, society in general, is kind of just letting Nazis kind of be, you know, fancy bad guys. I mean, Nazi zombies are quite weird because Nazis are already scary and bad enough. They don't need to be zombies. And to turn them into zombies, it's sort of like saying, what can we do to make them really bad? Yeah, and I, I won't mention the game, but pretty much that same game, in, in London, they put up Nazi zombies on a street as a PR stunt for Halloween, where the Nazi zombies would just vomit blood on you and this and that. And I looked at that. I kind of went off on the chief marketing guy. I did on Twitter. Of course, he blocked me. <laughs> because I was like, would you do that with the KKK in America? No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't put up zombie KKK members in the middle of New York City. You wouldn't, right? So don't do that with, with Nazis too, because it's just turned them into a joke. And also, for some people, this can also be deeply traumatic. It can, just walking down the street and just seeing some... Nazis, like, were they thinking that maybe as an old Holocaust survivor that's maybe walking past, you know? So that's why I think it's just, it's so, it's honestly, it's never going to stop. It isn't the only way we can actually fight back on that thing. It's just bringing more real stories about the Holocaust into video games, very much, and having more game developers do this. And, you know, showing really what Nazi Germany was because I even think you know um, there's another problem in video games recently with multiplayer games where you'll be able to play as the German army but in order to sell cosmetics right they removed the Nazi symbol so they're just like this is just a German army and I'm like that's even worse because I, I talk to Germans and they're like no we don't want this to be known as the German army we want this to be known as Nazi Germany because we want nothing to do with this kind of thing so literally erasing history yeah they're literally erasing history because they're trying to not offend them you said well just don't have everyone anyone play as germans not even germans <laughs> yeah, want not. to play as germans doing those times like it i mean there was this big game again they were selling a nazi skin but it wasn't a nazi and actually funny enough the name they were using right was actually a member of the resistance so they had to change that again it just thought and I was just like, you spent $100 million on this game and you can't even get that right. And I think it's, again, if we just had Holocaust edu- Holocaust organizations, if we had them more engaged with the video game companies, right, and say, imagine they went up to these big um, game companies and said they were like, hey, we think maybe you should actually tackle some of these things. We'll be here to advise you how to do it in good taste. I think that would actually to be so much more beneficial than erasing everything, pretty much. Because that's kind of what we've entered in video games. We've entered erasing history, which is worse, it is in my opinion, than, than trying to do something and failing at it. Because at least, you know, you're trying, and then the next person will try again, you know, because um, cause I've always seen this too. I think art, you know, I mean, I've also said this to because uh, also I've had some some like students and some people who make games who want to make uh, like had some students in Latvia who pretty much they're trying to make this VR game project about this guy up in Latvia who saved a bunch of Jewish people and they were asking me for advice they were and they're all Latvians they are pretty much none of them are Jewish but they want to do this story and I told them like you should absolutely do a story to find really some more platforms don't just have it vr because i was like this history and the history of this man right is also your history too you're proud of what he did you want to tell his story i love that go ahead very much so I, that, that's one thing where, and i think a lot of organizations they're tried because you know i got scared at one point to do all this stuff right they're scaring the young people pretty much into not doing these things rather than just telling them, hey, because give them a chance and be like, we're going to guide you. We're going to help you pretty much. Because I think the more people feel comfortable telling all these stories, the more collective memory, the more we remember it, the more we be taken seriously 
And I think the better it can be for everyone, because young people are the ones shaping the future. But if we retain young people, you cannot talk about this. This is not your right to do it. This is this and that. Then it's all going to be erased. I, I think it's like, um, like I've seen sometimes there's been some bad, and I don't know if this is true, but once I saw that there was this terrible TikTok challenge, right, where I think people were dressing up as Holocaust victims. I don't, I don't. That was true. Yeah. So, and I don't know why they were doing it, honestly. I don't know if it's because they were young and just been like, maybe this is a good idea or not. And I kind of felt like, I'm sure some of them had good intentions, right? I'm sure not everyone had bad intentions. And I kind of felt like for some of these influencers, rather than, you know, say you're shaming them, it's going to them and being like, hey, terrible, mate, don't do that. But maybe there's other ways you can do it. Maybe you can do a TikTok where you can talk about history and this and that. Like, that, I, I, guess, I guess I have a lot more different approach where I'm like, if someone messes up when they're trying to create something, rather than shame them to not do it again, is, is try and point them in the right direction very much. Because I, I kind of saw it as, you know, again, I'm sure there's bad actors, right? But I'm sure there was some who maybe thought this was a good idea and that didn't and didn't have any bad intentions. And I think those ones, those are the people who can maybe try and bring in because, again, when you're seeing, like, again, a lot of... Cause, because what, what I've seen just from young Jewish uh, people, right, some of the things they make on social media, I think it's just great. And I'm just looking at it and I'm like thinking, wow, these museums should be hiring them to handle their social media accounts because they're even teaching me. They are. And I think it's because, again, they're speaking the language, the platform, they're kind of appealing to everyone they are. So... Yeah, that's kind of how I kind of view art and all these things. I just want to encourage people to make this more and not just think it's only books that can do this because let's just be honest, how many Holocaust books are there now? You know, there's, 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 there's so many, there is, right? But if there's more kind of digital things, people just become more... I mean, that's why even Outswitch is doing that VR thing there. Outswitch is very forward thinking. In, in terms of everything. And so I just think just thinking about these new ideas, trying them out, some may succeed, some may not, but that's that's the whole point of art and trying things, that you're going to fail and sometimes do something terrible and not even realise it. You are. But I, I just think we should just be there and just be like, hey, you messed up, but we're here to help. So that's, that's kind of what I'm help, hoping with this project, that I can just actually help and inspire lots of more young developers to do this subject very much. And then, and then I hope, you know, if it does well, that a lot more organizations become open to this because they are following it. It, I think they're pretty much like, they don't know that they can't follow it. So if it does well, it's like, oh, okay, we can do this now. But if it doesn't do well, it's like, oh, okay, good thing we weren't associated with it, you know? But I hope if it does well, it opens up your small organizations open to doing this and more young people. Because, I mean, even when, when you talk inside the uh, universities, all those things, like if they could just come up with, if you could even do classes where, or kind of classes where it could be like, hey, why don't you guys work on different me a digital memory project? How would you do it, pretty much? You know, all those things. Because I think compared, what's so great with digital, right? is that we can reach people all over the world, right? So when you have these things done in classes where it's like, just locally, it's only that class that sees it. But if it's digital, everyone can kind of see it. And I think that's why it, it could just be amazing. And I think, again, so many more people would be remembering that and actually knowing about the... Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And... And, you know, hopefully this doesn't just your your game doesn't just sort of encourage young people to think differently about the Holocaust or research about the Holocaust, but also gamers and, and gaming culture, because from the outside perspective, you know, I, I, I personally am not a huge gamer. But from, from what I'm reading, it seems that there is a bit of an anti-Semitism problem among gamers in the gaming industry. And on a few weeks ago, 
on the podcast, we spoke about anti-Semitism and Nazi imagery being spread through children's video games like Roblox and, and Minecraft, where, where some users were even building virtual concentration camps. And this is not present just in the games themselves, but also on gaming platforms like Twitch, which is the world's biggest streaming site for watching video games. You know, it gets more than 30 million site visits per day. The company even said in August that it was going to clamp down on like hate raids, which, you know, when users experience this torrent of anti-Semitic abuse and images of swastikas, including homophobic abuse and other racist abuse. Um, Luke, why do you think that video games have been used in particular to spread this kind of anti-Semitism? Well, I, I think it's kind of, if you notice, any digital media right now is where anti-Semitism spreads. So it's social media, video games all those things. And I think what's happened with video games is, oh my God, it's, it's, it sounds like this podcast, it sounds like I'm just talking bad about organizations, but it's more like, I'm more like sounding the alarm. I am pretty much. So no one's, no one's focusing on video games. That is pretty much no one's for even the biggest one in America just does studies. Right. But I can't even talk to them. Even if I'm kind of like the, I mean, I'm the most known Jewish game developer, you know, about all the Jewish kind of things. And even I can't get them to talk to me while I'm like, you're the biggest one. You need to be talking to game companies. You need to be doing this. You need to be doing that. So instead, I'm doing all this alone, talking to gaming companies, trying to figure out how we can actually stop these things pretty much from happening. And it's spreading everywhere. I mean, I remember, like, just so you know how much... Um, uh, some organizations don't know about games. So there's this video game, right, where you can't play like a terrorist. And it was on Steam. And basically just murder a bunch of Israelis, all those things. And I, I was just kind of like, okay, this isn't in the best taste kind of kind of thing. So I showed it around some people. He's like, it's not good, right? Then it ended up in a Haratz article it did. And also the Daily Mail uh, article. And then basically Steam is a platform just where you download games pretty much, where anyone can submit games and you just download them. And I just noticed a big disconnect. We need to boycott the streaming service of Steam. And I was like, it's not a streaming service kind of thing. And that's why I noticed read really a big disconnect where it's, it's because organizations are just not treating video games seriously yet. That they aren't, and I think that's why Nazis have just kind of been overflowing it. And it's kind of um, game companies aren't going to do anything until a big organization comes to them. And it's like, hey, you got to fix this kind of thing, you know? Because I say, if you had one of the biggest organizations like in the UK or in America went to them as like, this is a problem on your platform. They wouldn't want to be seen as, oh, we're going to say no to them. They're going to be like, okay, okay, we listen, we listen. You kind of, because as always, says, they won't fix it. They won't. It's just how things are until there's noise. So if anti-Semitism in video games and the gaming industry is not going to be taken seriously until video games are taken seriously, what will it take for these organizations to take video games seriously? But if that's the problem is I don't even know because we're the biggest industry, period. We're bigger than movies and music combined. We are. We're the shapers of culture. I don't know what it is where it's not taken seriously. <laughs> that's what's so... I mean, I have um, been working with this Israeli organization, which has been really, really good to me, Um they have very much but it, it's it's just it's more in in america i really don't know and i think it could be an age difference i think it's maybe because uh you know older people don't exactly know what video games are so they probably just think it's still mario brothers so they're probably like how's that nazis and mario brothers kind of thing well us younger people were like no it's there it's just as bad as social media if you have in roblox concentration camps and in minecraft nazi swastikas like yeah, this is like... That's a problem. Yeah, it, 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 it's a problem. And even the kind of... Uh, so, I mean, some some places, like, in I actually work uh, closely up with the Toronto uh, people I do, the Toronto Museum, and they have people of their organization who study all those things, that study video games. So some are starting to get into it, you know, 
um, kind of be pioneering the way, but I kind of just feel like every organization needs to look into it. I mean, I've just even had some issues, like even getting it kind of out to the press at times, like where it's like, hey, this is all these big problems going on. It's just, again, because people aren't, it's so weird. Video games are the biggest thing ever, right? But the mainstream press still doesn't treat it like, a big thing yet it's, it's so weird you know like how mainstream press will talk about indie films more than than big video games it's 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 it's, it's such an interesting and that's why i think nazis have really anti anti semites have really gone into that space because they can get away with it more they can get away with let's put it this way right they, they can basically put inside roblox and fortnite and minecraft they can recruit kids inside those games right on the biggest platforms without any consequence, you know? So that's, and again, I understand the game developers because it's hard for them alone just to do that. Cause it's like anyone can build anything in Minecraft, right? So when you're making the game, you're not thinking Nazis are going to join. You're thinking this is amazing. They bring all the world together. And it's like, Oh no. Okay. It's Nazis now, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like how everyone, you know, Facebook wasn't meant to turn into what it turned into. You know, the original plan was just, yes, just talk to family and friends. And it's like, oh, God, <laughs> you know, and it's full of white supremacists. <laughs> kind of. I mean, I think I remember reading an article recently about how the competitor to Twitter, which was meant to be the anti-Nazi platform, and then it ended up becoming the Nazi platform. And that's, so that's kind of why, again, also these game developers, they... They just, they don't understand, like, again, the people I work with, like, they understand memes. And I'm just finding out all these different Nazi memes, which I had no clue about. So that's what I mean. You need these young people who really un understand neo-Nazis, anti-Semites, the code words. And so then they could actually talk to the game developers. Because the game developers, I honestly think they will be open to it. They just need some kind of direction they do, pretty much. To, to all these things and if it's just when we're separating and kind of not talking to each other you know we're not managing to fight hate together mm. yeah well well you don't just fight hate uh in in your video games do you because you're also the founder of voices of the forgotten which is a non-profit organization created last year um by you to promote awareness around the Holocaust. And this has led uh, you to working with Holocaust survivors. What inspired the creation of this organization? And what does it do? Basically, I, cr I created it because of the video game, right? Because the video game, it's free, it's not for profit, it is. So I created it for that. But what I really kind of went into with that organization, it's still quite small. It is, you know, because I started directing a video game, so trying to run a non-profit a bit. But what we do basically from time to time is that we help organize fundraisers for Holocaust survivors in poverty. We do, because that's, that's an area which I think we need to focus on. So I know in the UK, you have an amazing organization, the Association of Jewish Refugees. There's a fantastic job looking after people that. Uh, but in America, you only have like the blue card you do. And so what we do, we do fundraisers and we'd send the money to the blue card. So we've helped organize sometimes some online ones, like pretty much via Instagram with some Jewish influencers. So that's really one aspect which we like to focus on, we do. And also like at times like we've helped uh, some trans refugees pretty much from the Middle East get asylum status in France. We haven't really promoted that much. We haven't. Um, we just kind of do a lot of things just basically here and there. We do. But the main thing is really to push Holocaust awareness digitally. It is pretty much. So, so we're the first game after. And that's why I say first, because we actually plan to make more. We do. I mean, we plan to actually after this one, I mean, are we, are we very close with the family or that? I plan to tell the story of Eva Koshova, who I mentioned earlier, who was the, who created the first lesbian bar in New York, who died in Auschwitz, but I'm going to tell her story in basically a video game form. So we're going to continue doing all these kind of things. We get So it's kind of, yeah, because I was kind of like, okay, this is the first game about France, and I was like, I want to tell a real story of someone, 
it can be very impactful. And so, we, yeah, that's what I mean. We actually have several stories. We nearly have too many stories. We do nearly not enough uh, time and all those things. And that's kind of we're hoping to grow and just pretty much just help become the new way to county digitally. I mean, we're even planning like a digital Holocaust museum, which is later down the line too. But basically, because one of my things is like, like I mentioned earlier, people in rural areas do not have access to museums. They should be able to have access to them. And I think Outswitch, fantastic, their VR project, pretty much there should be more of that. So we're basically hoping to build more things, kind of, not necessarily that, but basically, again, digital Holocaust museums. So that's kind of where we're kind of going. So I think once the light and darkness is out, then kind of every single can't be the first step of where we kind of head. And I think it goes with the name, right? The name Voices of the Forgotten. We're basically really focusing, what I really focus on is not really Holocaust survivors. I focus on the families who no longer are here, pretty much. That That's really my focus. It's on giving them a voice, actually as remembering these people, pretty much. And, and so that that's really what makes it different and our, and our focus. And all, all we want to do, hopefully in the game and organization, is just kind of to help, um, you know, all these fantastic organizations uh, that very traditional kind of get into the digital space. And that's because I, I think it's one thing which I noticed in America, right? And I, I actually love how it is in the UK. UK, Honestly, in the UK, people are a lot more friendly. You can get a lot more things done. I mean, because even like David Bedell, right? You can actually talk to him. I even managed to talk to him. Like he, you cannot get hold of any American celebrity. You can't very much as Jewish. Like it's just, even if it's for Holocaust fundraiser, you're like, hey, the Holocaust fundraiser. It's like, oh no, he can't because he's very busy. I'm like, no, he has nothing booked. It, it's it's it, it's so. It, 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 it's it's so different. While in the UK, it can just be like, David Bedell, hey, I'm making this game. What are you saying? Oh, it's awesome. Thank you, David Bedell. Like, it's, it, 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 it's, it's so like... <laughs> that, that's what I mean. It, it, yeah. And even the Holocaust it's, organization, they're just so much like, hey, Luke, what do you want? Oh, hi. It's just, it's so... And I don't know what it is, because again, there isn't many Jews in the UK, but it's just so much... Um, and I feel like, you know, even Holocaust Education Awareness, Holocaust Memorial Day, which is in the UK, which is so huge, like, they take it so seriously compared to the US. And in the US, right, honestly, I feel like it's high school. I, I do pretty much. So I go to, like, different organizations and they'll be like, bah, 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 these people are doing this. Bah, bah, bah. And I'm just like, guys, can you just all work together? Because if we work together we could make something fantastic and everyone can come. No, and I think that's maybe why uh, Jews in the UK, right? I mean, when it comes to fighting anti-Semitism, do a really good job. Kind of, I mean, the, the success which I've seen, like, often, you know, like Twitter, all that, it's a really good job. Even the investigations which I see come out, like, it's it's really good in the UK. So, and I, so I kind of feel like, America needs to adapt that more, very much. And so that's kind of what I'm helping with these digital things I'm doing, is to be like, hey, I'm not trying to compete with everyone. I just want us all to work together so we can all bring this more awareness, because that's all our goal over here. It is. So, I, so I think that's why, and I guess you kind of need to have someone with a bit different ideas, not, not competitive eyes. And that's why, again, I like to move the money aspect out of it for me you know i make make a living via my own games because i don't need to worry about donors i don't need to worry about paychecks i don't need to worry about politics i can come in and just be like we need to solve this or we need to do this because you know i've just noticed like you know like finding out again like eva koshva's story right she should be an icon honestly but she got erased a bit because, you know, people weren't too accepting of LGBTQ before, very much. So I think that's why all these, yeah, you know, I'm not trying to toot my horn or anything, but kind of having a different a pair of fresh eyes kind of can do things a bit differently. And that's why I think David Bedell does it so well, because 
he wrote a book because he's just really passionate about it. But when I see him talk, I'm just like, he's better than any American organization which I have seen. When Whoopi Goldberg, you know, said those things, right? I was just like, okay, don't don't put her on suspension. Invite over David Bedell for a show, actually. Like, have have him talk because when he talks... You get it right away. He 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 he's not trying to be. Everyone kind of gets it. They they do. So I think that's why he's been so effective. Because again, he doesn't have much agenda. It's a personal thing to him. It is. There's no agenda. There's no politics. There isn't. And I think that's kind of what we maybe need to remove sometimes at times. Because again, when you have people at big organizations. They have to think about their donors, have to think about that. So it's like, duh, 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 you know, very safe, very this. And he just presents it in such a simple way. In two minutes, you get it. You do. And everyone can can kind of um, ag- agree to it. So, so that's why I think, uh, I mean, I, I, I do have have faith in the future, kind of, even if a lot of things are negative, right? Where it's like, oh, nothing's getting done. I, th- I think I do have faith in the future kind of everything. Yes, it was all the young people, you know, again, reaching out to me, whether like, we want to make games, we want to do this pretty much. So I think I, 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 yeah, I really do think we're actually in a good space. We just kind of need to seem to be the first ones to kind of show people it's okay. It is to do this pretty much. And then more people can, can come in. Cause, cause again, like I said, I think these are the Holocaust, I think every European should be allowed to tell the story because it's what happened in Europe, it did pretty much. Like, I don't think... And what I've noticed, again, working with organizations, like, sometimes the most passionate people aren't Jewish. They are pretty much. Like, some of the biggest uh, anti-Nazi people I know pretty much aren't Jewish. They are, and they researching, and they're passionate, and they're... You know, the passion even about Yiddish culture, all those things they are. So I, I think, so, so that, that's why, again, I think I have a lot of um, faith in that regard. And I think, again, a lot of people should be doing more what the UK does for Holocaust Memorial Day. That's just, honestly, it's fantastic what they do. Mm. Yeah, um, I, I agree. Luke, I've had a really good time talking to you, and I want to thank you for, for coming on here. Before we wrap up, when and where... Can people play The Light in the Darkness? So I'm hoping to launch it this year, but I will delay it if I'm not happy with it to next year. But I'm hoping to launch it this year and it'll be available for Xbox, it will, for free. Also Windows. We possibly might also be launching a PlayStation version too and also a Switch version. But right now we're focusing on Xbox, we are. And, and Windows, um, so pretty much this year. And I guess I guess the best way is kind of just follow me on Twitter to just kind of find out, you know, when the launches and all those things. Because I'm because again, since it's not for not for profit, so I don't need to necessarily launch it at a certain date to make money. I'm kind of like when it's perfect. But there's a strong chance, ninety percent chance this year at the end of the year. Yeah. So, so what's your Twitter? How can people keep up with you and, and news of the game? Uh, Twitter is basically Luke Bernard, L U C then Bernard, my name, and a lot of time could just me spoon nonsense and getting fights with people, but there'll also be updates on the game too. It's Twitter. It's Twitter, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people know what to expect. <laughs>